Hi, Life Group Leaders. I get the joy of finishing out our study in the book of James, and I hope you've enjoyed it and your students have enjoyed it. Today's lesson is Lesson 13. It's found on page 108 in our book. Our next study will be Genesis chapter 25, and I think it's going to be a good study as well. As I read the lesson and then looked at the content, one thing became very clear to me that there's no way I could cover all of it. And so I just kind of selected verses 7 through 11. I also had the same tension when I was preaching through the book this last year. Now let me just mention to you that the final verses that our writer uh, mentions uh, is complicated. It's been used by many people and it's been also uh, misused by many people because they fail to dig out what James is actually saying and they forget that really what James is doing in those final verses is dealing with prayer. In fact, the word prayer is used eight times. And so if we're going to faithfully handle the text, prayer should be the concentration of these last verses. Many just grab anointing with oil and off they go and frankly leave the context and misuse the text. When I preached James, I tried to be faithful to what James wrote, not what people like Joel Olstein or Kenneth Copeland or Benny Hinn and others desired it to say. In a general sense, James says prayer should be paramount in everything we do, and especially when someone is sick. As we conclude our study and then look at the final verses, let me quickly remind you of what we have studied. James is a practical book, but it is not void of doctrine, as some would like to say. It very clearly shows that if you say you believe like a believer is supposed to believe, then you should behave as a believer is supposed to behave. Saving faith works visibly and vocally. This was important for the readers to get, especially as they lived under deep persecution. But it's also important for us to get as well. Faith simply works. Now for them, they were under persecution because they were Jews and many Gentiles reacted against them. And they were Christians and many Jews reacted against them. So in our text, James deals with all of that, and it's a really good section of Scripture. Life group leaders, at this point, what I'm going to do is read James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. And after I read it, I'm going to ask my class this. Did you catch the five references to patience and then also the two references to endurance? What I'm going to do is follow basically the same outline I used when I preached through the text this past June because I think it addresses our study really well. Let's see if we can answer this question. How can we as believers persevere through persecution? I'm going to be sharing three themes with my class. The first thing I'm going to share is that pressure must be handled. James has his pastor coat on as he tries to encourage his readers. In the first five verses of this chapter, he was challenging them, especially the wealthy that was in their community. But now he shifts a little bit. He becomes a pastor, and he begins with the word, with the word therefore, and he says, Therefore, be patient. In the New Testament, there are two main words for patience. And James uses both of them in our text. In verses 7, 8, and 10, James will use a word that is made up of two words. We call it a compound word. One of the words he uses is the word long. And the other word that he uses is the word for anger. And so James says, when pressure hits, let your anger be stretched out. Let it be long-tempered. 
In other words, don't lose control. Don't let your button get pushed. Have a long fuse. And the illustration he uses is a good one. You see, all a farmer can do is work when it's time to work, and then he has to wait. Wait for the rain to come, wait for the growing to take place, and then comes the harvest. The early rains were for planting, and the latter rains were for harvesting. So after he first plants, he has to wait and wait and wait. Actually, it was out of his control, so really he could do nothing. But notice that James gives instruction about this kind of patience and how we are to be patient. You see, biblically, patience isn't just throwing up your hands and quitting. In verses 8 and 9, here's what James does. He says in verse 8, You too be patient. Strengthen your heart because the coming of the Lord is near. Verse 9, he says, Do not complain, brethren, against one another. And so in a sense, what he's trying to do to help them be patient is helping them to know that all of the pressure that we go through is really temporary because Jesus is coming and we should be looking for that day when he comes. That's very important for us. We could say, exert discipline and control because Jesus is coming again. And Jesus will make everything right. And so patience isn't just resignation, but it has intention to it. Now the other word for patience that James uses is found in verse 11. And it means to stay under or hold up under the pressure. Now, where the first word applies to people, this word applies to circumstances. So he says, stay firm, stay strong. And then he'll mention the prophets. He'll mention Job, remaining strong all through their ordeals. They eventually won. So will we. John Piper made a great statement. He said the soul would have no rainbow if the eye had no tear. All of us go through difficult times. That's why he says strengthen your heart and don't complain one to another. The second thing I'm going to bring out to my class is that there is a promise that must be believed. You see, the ultimate message from James to his readers is that pressure will indeed end someday, and we must believe that. In the Bible, that's called hope. Now, in verse 7, 8, and 9, we have a reference to the return of the Lord. He is the great equalizer. He is the restorer. He is the deliverer. He comes to rescue us. It is only in this pressure that we begin to realize the beauty of our coming deliverance. As a Christian, we should chew on this. To be delivered in the lion's den, you have to be in it. To be protected in a furnace of fire, you must be in it. To feel God's rescue, there must be the need of rescue. And that's why patience and endurance is important for us. We must not sit on the sidelines and just watch the water flow past. We got to get out of the boat just like Peter did. And then my third point is going to be this. There is a provision that must be trusted. And I'm going to read verses 11, 12, and 13. James helps us remember that in our pressure, it is not the circumstances of life or even the conduct of God that determines our victory because both can be confusing and even perplexing at times. Sometimes God's ways are different and we don't quite understand it all. So we must trust the character of God. 
And James reminds us that God is full of compassion and God is always merciful. Compassion is also a compound word and it's only used here in the New Testament. One of the words he uses is the word abundant and the other word is a word that we get the English word spleen from and it means the gut or the intestine. Back then the seat of emotion was expressed as the gut or something deep inside a person. It is a strong word for compassion and pity. The other word mercy means tender. And this form of this word is only used here in all of the Bible and then also in Luke chapter 6 verse 36. It is a passage where Jesus is preaching and in fact maybe Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good without expecting anything in return. Don't judge. Do not condemn. Be givers. And he says, be merciful. Be tenderly compassionate, just like your father. Well, I think it's a, it's a great way to end a wonderful study. And uh, when you're through, and at least when I'm through, I'm going to try to get our people excited about the study of Genesis that's coming up. Well, again, let me just say to you, thank you for all that you do. We're about to enter the holiday season, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. For us as Southern Baptists and at Indian Springs Baptist Church, this time of year is always exciting. It's the time of year that we kick off our mission offering, Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And we take this offering so that we can put more money directly into the foreign mission field. And so remind your people the importance of that. Our goal this year is $60,000. That sounds like a lot of money, and I guess it is, but not for God. And every year our church so wonderfully gives. And there's no telling till we get to eternity just how many people heard the message of the gospel because we were willing to give. God bless you. I hope you have a great day as you study a wonderful passage of Scripture.